sent forth the model time machine. Who set forth the model time machine on its interminable voyage. We saw the lever turn. I am absolutely certain there was no trickery. There was a breath of wind. Sure it is. 
Hello? 
who saw him next, and the whole table turned towards the door. He was in an amazing plight. His coat was dusty and dirty and smeared with green down the sleeves. His hair disordered, and as it seemed to me, grayer, either with dust and dirt or because its color had actually faded. His face was, his face was ghastly pale. His chin had a brown cut on it, a cut half healed. His expression was haggard and drawn as by intense suffering. For a moment he hesitated in the doorway as if he had been dazzled by the light. Then he came into the room. He walked with just such a limp as I have seen in footsore tramps. We stared at him in silence, expecting him to speak. He said not a word, but came painfully to the table and made a motion toward the wine. The editor filled a glass of champagne and pushed it towards him. He drained it, and it seemed to do him good, for he looked around the table, and the ghost of his old smile flickered across his face. What on earth have you been up to, man? said the doctor. The time traveler did not seem to hear. Don't let me disturb you, he said with a certain faltering articulation. I'm all right, he stopped held out his glass for more, and took it off at a draft. That's good, he said. His eyes grew brighter, and a faint color came into his cheeks. His glance flickered over our faces with a certain dull approval, and then went around the warm and comfortable room. Then he spoke again, still as if he were feeling his way among his words. I'm going to wash and dress, and then I'll come down and explain things. Save me some of that mutton. I'm starving for a bit of meat. He looked across at the editor, who was a rare visitor, and hoped he was all right. The editor began a question. Tell you presently, said the time traveler. I'm funny. Be all right in a minute. his glass and walked towards the staircase door. Again I remarked his lameness and the soft padding sound of his footfall, and standing up in my place, I saw his feet as he went out. He had nothing on them but a pair of tattered, blood-stained socks. Then the door closed upon him. I had half a mind to follow, till I remembered how he detested any fuss about himself. For a minute, Perhaps my mind was wool gathering. Then, remarkable behavior of an eminent scientist, I heard the editor say, thinking, after his wont, in headlines. And this brought my attention back to the bright dinner table. What's the game? said the journalist. Has he been doing the amateur cadger? I don't follow. I met the eye of the psychologist and read my own interpretation in his face. I thought of the time traveler limping painfully upstairs. I don't think anyone else had noticed his lameness. The first to recover completely from his surprise was the medical man who rang the bell. The time traveler hated to have servants waiting at dinner for a hot plate. At that, the editor turned to his knife and fork with a grunt, and the silent man followed suit. The dinner was resumed. The conversation was exclamatory for a little while, with gaps of wonderment. And then the editor got fervent in his curiosity. Does our friend eke out his modest income with a crossing?
he resorted to a caricature. Hadn't they any clothes brushes in the future? The journalist, too, would not believe at any price, had joined the editor in the easy, in the easy work of heaping ridicule on the whole thing. They were both the new kind of journalist, very joyous, irreverent young men, our special correspondent in the day after was saying, or rather shouting, when the time traveler came back. He was dressed in ordinary evening clothes, and nothing save his haggard look remained of the change that had startled me. I say, said the editor hilariously, these chaps here say you have been traveling into the middle of next week. All about Roseberry, will you? What will you take for the lot? The time traveler came to the place reserved for him without a word. He smiled quietly in his old way. Where's my mutton? he said. What it treated is to stick a fork into meat again. Story, cried the editor. Story be damned, said the time traveler. I want something to eat. I won't say a word until I get some peptone into my arteries. Thanks. And the salt. One word, said I. Have you been time traveling? Yes, said the time traveler, with his mouth full, nodding his head. I'd give a shilling a line for a verbatim note, said the editor. Traveler pushed his glass towards the silent man and rang it with his fingernail. At which the silent man, who had been staring at his face, started convulsively and poured him wine. The rest of the dinner was uncomfortable. For my own part, sudden questions kept on rising to my lips, and I dare say it was the same with the others. The journalist tried to relieve the tension by telling anecdotes, anecdotes of Hetty Potter. The time traveler devoted his attention to his dinner and displayed the appetite of a tramp. The medical man smoked a cigarette and watched the time traveler through his eyelashes. The silent man seemed even more clumsy than usual and drank champagne with regularity and determination out of sheer nervousness. At last, the time traveler pushed his plate away and looked round us. I suppose I must apologize, he said. I was simply starving. I've had a most amazing time. He reached out his hand for a cigar and cut the end. But come into the smoking room. It's too long a story to tell over greasy plates. And ringing the bell in passing, he led the way into the adjoining room. You have told Blank and Dash and Joe's about the machine, he said to me, leaning back in his easy chair and naming the three new guests. But the thing's a mere paradox, said the editor. I can't argue tonight. I don't mind telling you the story, but I can't argue. I will, he went on, tell you the story of what has happened to me, if you like, but you must refrain from interruptions. I want to tell it, badly. Most of it will sound like lying, so be it. It's true, every word of it, all the same. I was in my laboratory at four o'clock, and since then... Since then I've lived eight days, such days as no human being ever lived before. I'm nearly worn out, but I shan't sleep till I've told this thing over to you. Then I shall go to bed. But no interruptions. Is it agreed? Agreed, said the editor, and the rest of us echoed, agreed. And with that the time traveler began his story, as I have set it forth. He sat back in his chair at first and spoke like a weary man. Afterwards, he got more animated. In writing it down, I feel with only too much keenness the inadequacy of pen and ink, and above all, my own inadequacy, to express its quality. You 
soon friend.